Greetings, scholars. Um, today we're gonna try something a little bit different. Yes, you're seeing double. There's like previous version me and me today. Um, I've gotten some emails from students that are currently in this class that have had me in like a real face-to-face -face class before. And you've been very kind in saying that it feels less candid or that it's less engaging. You're trying to say that me just speaking into a recorder by myself, I'm boring, more boring than normal. Um, so I thought I would try today. Um, I've been teaching this class in an accelerated format. So I've done all of these lectures just slightly earlier this semester. Um, and they're all recorded um, from the live performances. So instead of me repeating it calmly to myself in here, I'm going to give you the live performance that you see paused over there. I fast forwarded into about a half hour in the class. Um, we're gonna get the meat of the PowerPoint here. I might stop it at a super awkward spot um, just because I also, sat with them and watched the videos, like you're gonna have a really nice copy of the videos posted in your Blackboard. You don't have to sit here watching a recording of me recording a screenshot of a screen. You know what I'm saying? So um, this'll be maybe an hour, hour and a half of that three hour and 11 minute uh, lecture. But I thought I'd give you a flavor of live for performance. So um, if this is more fun, it's certainly more candid. I may or may not swear because I do that sometimes when I'm not really like watching myself. So apologies if um, I use expletives because I get very excited about the art. But um, I thought I would give you this opportunity to see what sort of a live version of the lectures might look like. And if you like this, we can do it for the rest of the term or a couple of them if it's kind of a mixed bag. So uh, without further ado, let's get rocking on this lecture. Like we hit total perfection where you're like, holy crap, that dude paints just like it's a photograph. That lady looks like she could jump out of that canvas and kiss you. That is realism. And then everyone's like, okay, now what? And then there's like crickets. And it's like, man, screw realism. Who cares if it looks like a photo, even though we haven't invented photos yet. You know what I mean? Like, what's art if it can't be more than the things that you see in real life? Like, oh, have you seen this daisy before? Great. I've seen a daisy too. Here's a picture of a daisy someone painted. It looks just like a daisy. But what about some total acid trip hellscape? I've never seen that before. Hieronymus boss is gonna show us that's what so um we've got this idea of like high art we've mastered how to make a look person look exactly like a person how to make a landscape look exactly like the depth of a landscape how to make things look real and then from there we can show the unreal the unseeable right and that's really I think where art finally is good enough to then do whatever it wants and that's what we're going to do tonight is look at this like kind of very awkward how do we break the rules of perfection and still accomplish something right rather than just go back to like early gothic art where it's just a bit flat and bent right oh uh, yes so, the angsty teen years of art yeah so here we are in the angsty teen years of art it's going to be awesome there's vegetables and hellscapes and drugs. Um, all right, save screen. I have so many emails blinking at me. Ms. Watts, what is this uh, this time period called with, with this art? Mannerism. Mannerisms, okay. Cool. Yep, so it's called Renaissance Mannerism because people, people sometimes don't like to break it. They just say it's the decline of the high renaissance and you know we're arguing that it's not like we're deliberately doing something very different like we had to have like 1950s bubblegum pop music in order to get rock and roll like acid rock in the late 60s couldn't have happened without the like very tin can stuff of the 50s right like we had to we had to build our boundaries to break them and then make them into something new and different um, so mannerism is still sort of 
it's Renaissance mannerism because it's a direct sort of, I, I would say, reaction or commentary on the high Renaissance. So let's look at some of this bananas stuff that I keep talking about. Uh, all right. So mannerism. There's a couple different ideas on why it's called mannerism. But uh, one of them is, you know, like, it's not obviously manners because nobody had any during the mannerism period. Um, but in the manner of and sort of breaking that manner of. So, like, once I've studied Raphael for, like, 20 years, it took him three months to paint an original Raphael, but I could copy his shit in three weeks, right? Um, well, probably not. But you know what I mean. So we've learned the mastery we can copy the great masters of the high Renaissance and then what, what do we do with it? How do you sort of like make your own name? Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at now. So notice how there's a squiggly line in between. That's not just cause I was getting fancy. We are back to ish when it comes to dates. So um, 1490 to 1520 is the high Renaissance period. That is a 30 year period. It's got hard, walls on either side like 1490 the great exchange the oil paint technology finally came flooding into italy 1520 da vinci and Raphael are dead what do you do without your like two biggest rock stars you change music right so there's two hard edges to that period but from now on just like the gothic period eh, depends on where you are and what you're looking at right so um, some places continue to paint in the high Renaissance style. Um, some places really um, didn't leave mannerism and move on to Baroque in the 16, in the year 1600. It maybe took them a couple decades. Or maybe they were already kind of getting into Baroque a decade or two before 1600. So um, that year 1600 is very, that's a soft date. So I'm going to say 1600-ish depends on where we are and what we're talking about. Um, remember, so this whole like 15-somethings is the 16th century. So we're now talking about the 16th century, the end of mannerism. Baroque is our 17th century stuff. So 1600 onward. Um, right. Let us remind you where we're starting. Actually, let me just go to my nonsense stuff here. Um, I wanted to bring this up just to remind you of how fast that transition was into the high Renaissance. Are you going to give me like a decent picture of this? Raw. Um, how do I? No, nope, I just totally downloaded that for no reason. Um, open image. How about that? Oh my God, it's so small. Uh, I'm so bad at technology. It's fine. Verrocchio, we're looking at the baptism of Christ, and everybody is zooming in on those angels because um, Verrocchio, this guy is who da Vinci studied under as a youth. He was a teenager. He came to Verrocchio, who was one of the great 15th century artists, um, and da Vinci got hired on. So you've got Verrocchio here. Like, doesn't this just totally look like every 15th century piece we were studying? All those enunciations, like weird, sort of not quite right with the body proportions, um, a bit stiff, pretty flat, very posed, but still getting that naturalism going on, still getting symbolism going on. We got some realism and humanism with movement and things. And then you've got those angels in the corner. Oops, that's a video. Um, let's grab this. So you've got these angels in the corner. You can see that one of these things doesn't look like the other. Obviously, Verrocchio painted Christ as the main figure because he was the main rock star artist of this house. Um, and his little, like, peon grad student uh, da vinci was in charge of the smaller figures in the corner look at those smaller figures this was a teenage da vinci it's a whole different level of mastery already i mean even look at that's verrocchio's cloth 
study, that's Da Vinci's cloth study. Like you can see that that's clearly like percaled cotton or maybe even silk. Like you've got a shine to it. You've got the crisp folds. You can feel the weight of the fabric. It's perfect. Um, you've got that sort of sfumato, hazy, misty look already, yet incredibly detailed hair. Like it looks like two completely different paintings in the same painting. Um, so this was basically the day that uh, Da Vinci got thrown out <laughs> of like, yep, you graduated, bye. So I think this is a great reminder piece, this Verrocchio, of just how fast the High Renaissance came upon us with basically the career of Da Vinci. Um, let me go back here and get on with my point. Um, just with that super fastness, we also kind of moved away from mastery pretty quick. So, um, you got the Renaissance. We talked about, I use the word mastery all the time. I think I used perfecting perfect perfectly or something was the title of your discussion board last week. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Everything's perfectly balanced, um, controlled, primary geometric shapes. It's very idealized. Again, um, Tao brought up brilliantly, like, why do all of his women look the same? Because they're like cookie cutter, the prettiest girl in Italy. Like there was an ideal that was the sought after beauty. Um, so everybody is sort of naturally posed. All the colors are in beautiful harmony. Um, it's all very natural. It's all very idealized natural, but harmony, control, perfection, mastery, blah, 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 blah. I've thrown up this list. You've got it here. So don't try to feverishly copy this right now. You've got it in the folder there. Um, notice now how we went from like normal and ideal to abnormal strangeness um elaborately involved in narratives i feel like they're kind of taking a book from when you look at those 15th century annunciation pictures and you're like what the ever-loving what is going on with like hands up in the sky and like laser beam baby jesus is shooting out at mary like you got weird stuff going on that's telling a pretty odd story uh, we're going right back to that with purpose in mannerism. Um, so we've got controlled, balanced compositions in Renaissance. We're deliberately quite disjointed in mannerism. Um, it's supposed to be a bit chaotic in a lot of ways. Um, uncanonical proportions. They start stretching and distorting the human figure again, but like on purpose this time instead of just didn't know any better. Um, again, figures sitting comfortably in a chair or sitting comfortably on the grass is what it looks like in the high Renaissance in mannerism. It's going to look deeply freaking uncomfortable to be sort of contorted in these very strange poses. Um, the colors I've seen it, uh, described as sour color palettes. <laughs> um, valid okay surprising colors is a nice way to say it but basically in the renaissance we were dealing with primary and secondary colors right so go back to your week one color wheel of you know we got yellow red and blue those are our primary colors and if you mix yellow and red you get orange if you mix yellow and blue you get green right so we're sticking with those primary and secondary colors a tertiary color are all those other crayons Right. So if you mix a secondary with a primary, you're getting that like reddish orange and you're getting the sort of like teal turquoise blues and you get sort of those like weird greenish like barf yellows and stuff like tertiary colors are all the other colors that are not sort of those nice, classic, comfortable secondary colors. Um, we're all about those in mannerism. The weirdest version of a color that you can find is what you paint with. Um, where they went for natural in the Renaissance, we're going for artificial in mannerism. So are you like excited to see this stuff now? Like, I hope I'm like really playing up the lead of just, it goes kind of bananas, but I would say with a purpose, but I think it's just that whole like freak out art for art's sake. Woo. Um, 
And it is the only reason that we get to have the Baroque, which, spoilers, is my absolute favorite uh, style, period, that we're covering. Don't think I've said that about every single one. I think I've said I love them all because they're all very important, but let's just, the Baroque is really where I fangirl out, like, real bad. Anyway, um, so let's remind us of where we're starting here. Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Perfect natural illusion, right? We've got, even with this very simple hill here, you've got atmospheric perspective as it sort of gets hazy in the background. You get this idea of depth of space. You've got shape, shade, shadow overlap here. You've got three-dimensional form. His knee really looks like it's sticking out. It's perfect natural illusion of reality. Um, an impossible act to follow. You can't. You can only mimic Raphael and Michelangelo now, right? You can only just try to be almost as good as the original rock stars. Because if you're trying to do perfect mastery, this is it. So now what? Like, art's over, the end. Um, so Michelangelo himself quits painting like this. Uh, he outlives his own era. He actually lives another 44 years. He dies in 1564. So he ends up being quite a major figure in the mannerism movement. And we're going to actually see that in this same room. So he did this commission in 1508, um, and then 25 years later, he gets brought back to paint one of the walls in this same chapel, and it's real different. Um, all right, so the reaction to the High Renaissance was to break the rules that created perfection. Um, more fractured, deliberately not smooth, comfy, and perfect. Um and again, unlike last time, it's not just like reverting back to forgetting how stuff works. It's doing it different on purpose. You know how to do it correctly, but then you deliberately distort. So you're not just mimicking nature. You're creating art with like air quotes around it. Picasso could actually do realism, by the way. He did beautiful realistic landscapes, but those didn't sell. <laughs> So he just started getting like bananas in his own head and we've got Picasso, but he wasn't incapable of doing realism. He proved he could do realism and then he went and did his art. Um, so we're moving away from humanism. And here's a little asterisk note to try to like understand the depth of how we try to understand politics and religion and social ideals just from like pictures. But uh, we can't. So we're moving away from humanism. That was a big thing as we were moving on with Giotto a couple of weeks ago. We talked about how everybody was sort of refocusing on the human life of Christ and what it's like to have the human experience and, you know, yay, Jesus the baby. Um, we're now moving into Neoplatonism, as in Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher. But... Um, it's like Christianifying ancient Greek philosophy, right? Um, so Neoplatonism started being argued away from that mortal human aspect back to a focus on heaven and the afterlife and the divine. Okay, so it's sort of that spark of divinity. And that's why I picked this one, because this could arguably be very early Neoplatonism. So humanism is all about the human experience and the fact that like we're kind of animals and we are born and we love and we suffer and we die. Um, cool. Whereas Neoplatonism, like Plato kind of talked about that spark of the divine within us. Like we're all demigods in our own way. If you thought to the ancient Greeks, that's how they sort of wrap their mind around it. Um, Neoplatonism or new Platonism was the Catholicified version where, you know, God puts the breath of life into Adam, the first man. And so technically he's got the spark of God himself in him. And that's what makes him so special. So that's what makes people more special than the other animals and stuff. Um, so not really thinking about our human existence in that sense, but thinking about that divine 
one millionth of a speck of the divine of God that we have in us makes us special and capable of achieving anything. It's like the ultimate, like, I don't know, you're a special star poster um, idea. So um, you can see easily that a couple weeks ago with what we were dealing with, like 15th century, that would have been blasphemy to be like, all men are a little bit God. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, we're monotheistic, thanks. Um, but kind of coming back to this creationism um, of Adam here, this is a very sort of Neoplatonic image we've got going on. It's the spark of life. We've got like a lump of clay that then gets the breath of God himself into it. Um, to inspire someone is literally to breathe, like re respire, to respirate is to breathe. Inspire is to like breathe into them. So inspiring someone, like hopefully you're not giving them mouth to mouth, but metaphorical mouth to mouth to resuscitate their spark of divinity. Um, so that's kind of where that comes from. Um, we're moving away from the human experience and what Jesus must have felt like when he was having nails driven through his hands because that sucks, um, what it was like to be a baby, all those things, to thinking of every single person as being a little bit divine, a little bit just touched by God. Um, all right, so remembering the Sistine Chapel, blah, blah, blah. 25 years later, remember we have the two Virgin of the Rocks, the like really sunny one from Da Vinci, and then that like really blue, kind of scary one, <laughs> um, where that was like exactly 25 years apart, and you kind of go like, dude, what happened to this man? Um, so here's Michelangelo in 1508, and then 25 years later we get um, The Last Judgment, 1534. I'm sorry, I, I will hide this, but then I won't know how to find you again, but that's fine. Um, so last judgment, this is the far wall of the Sistine Chapel. So the ceiling was the original work that we studied last week, um, and saw it in the art, art toolkit in week one. The last judgment is the far wall. Um, having been in this room as a youth, um, I will tell you that the exit to the room, it's not an option of whether or not you want to be like the souls that get to remain on earth. No, no, you have to go through hell. So everybody getting drugged down into the fiery pit. This is where the door is, is right here. I think you can see just the corner of it here at the bottom is that white sort of plinth is the door. Yeah. Anyway, um, question. Can somebody read it out for me? Or nothing good. Everything you say is amazing. Well, all right. If there's a question, um, I don't uh, really see a question asked. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I got it. I'm sorry. My, my computer is messing up. Um, so this is um uh, this is a mannerism, right? Because the last two um paintings you showed us are mannerisms. Nope. We we're kind of starting with here is high Renaissance. Okay. But I was here's gonna... guy mannerist. Okay, I'm sorry. I was a little bit confused because they didn't look like that distorted. I was like, I was like, huh? I was trying to see what you were, what you were talking about. Right. Talking yeah. About no. That. First one. Here we are in the beautiful, and I mean, dead giveaway of it's before 1520, so we're still in the High Renaissance. Um, but this is same guy, High Renaissance. Here we are, same guy, 25 years later, rocking the mannerist style. Um, it's a hellscape. Today is the Judgment Day. Um, it's very different. So let's look at some of the anti-Neoplatonism first. Um, so remember the Pieta, that like lovely sculpture we had of, um, the Madonna, the Virgin Mary holding her dead son coming off the cross on her lap. That's a beautiful sculpture. She is just like serene strength. It's quite lovely and moving. Um, Mary was literally the strong base to hold her full grown son um, who sacrificed his life in a selfless act. It's all quite beautiful in that sculpture. Now you've got those same two characters by the same artist um, where you've got 
by the way, that very beefy torso dude right here, like top center, is Jesus. So real different look to him. Um, he's been working out since his death. Uh, he's a very vengeful and violent figure, casting judgment. Uh, Mary, instead of being that like serene strength, is like cowering in the corner, afraid. Um, very submissive, like frightened, recoiling pose. Um, hell looks terrible with suffering, twisting bodies packed in the corner. So the lower right here where you can see like some flames coming up, that's the boatman leading the souls to hell. Um, but uh, heaven, which is the rest of this image here, looks pretty freaking crowded and awkward and not real peaceful either nobody looks happy none of this is a beautiful place not like oh yay heaven like heaven looks like a freaking riot that's not like the fun kind um so yeah things got dark real fast um so we seem to be getting back to that medieval christian ideal of fearing judgment of the divine rather than sort of enjoying life as God's gift. We are back to hellfire and damnation is the only reason that you don't do naughty things on a daily daily. Um, this composition is really fractured. It's very chaotic. I mean, it's just several different mob scenes overlapping in layers. Um, so yeah, so we've got, you see how everything is just packed in here. We got bodies over bodies there's lots of these very awkward poses. Like nobody is comfortable here. Nobody is sitting in like a nice comfortable position. Um, so there's, there's a lot of this distorted, contorted, um, uncomfortable, uh, positions, even on like, you know, the angels and saints in heaven. Um, note here, we've got, uh, St. Bartholomew, you know the saints by their um, method of martyrdom, a.k.a. execution. So remember Saint Denis from like week two where he's just walking around carrying his head with his Pope's hat on it? Um, yeah, so he'd be walking around in heaven like with his head under his elbow like a football wearing his Pope's hat, and that'd be him. Um, St. Teresa, she was run over by a giant spiked wheel and uh, stabbed slash crushed to death, so she's holding a piece of her wheel of torture here. Um, St. Bartholomew was flayed alive. So here he is holding his empty sack of flesh. Um, and let's do a little close up on that because, um, who's that? That's St. Bartholomew. Um, the dude who was martyred by being skinned alive. Um, so we're zooming in here because you've noticed over the last couple weeks that uh, most of the art that we've looked at, the artist will try to do like sneak in a self portrait. If there's a crowd, like every adoration scene where like there's a crowd coming to see baby Jesus, uh, we've got the artist in there somewhere. Right. Um, so this is, um, Michelangelo's self-portrait and not St. Bartholomew, but rather his face is the dead sack of flesh. So Michelangelo's self-portrait is himself as the skinned carcass of St. Bartholomew, not of St. Bartholomew himself. Um, so yeah, um, he's showing himself as a pile of dead flesh rather than any of the literally hundreds of characters he could have thrown himself in as. So it's Michelangelo? Um, yeah, Michelangelo like put his own face on that. When we go back to the School of Athens, if I've got that, I don't think we have a picture of the school. For a change, I have not put Raphael's School of Athens up in this slideshow. I know, I show it to you every freaking week, even if it's not important, because it is important, because it's perfect. Um, we'll swing back to that, but remember the guy who's kind of in the foreground, resting his elbow on the table, and then he's resting his chin on his hand. That's kind of got, like, scruffy black hair. That's Michelangelo, according to Raphael, painted around this time, whereas this is Michelangelo, according to Michelangelo. Um, dead flesh carcass. 
Um, I like how I like how he painted the person who's you know sack of flesh right there, be it the person that's holding it still has a skin on. Like it's not like he's painting muscle or anything. It's just no. Well, I I think <laughs> I think you need to have your skin back after you're martyred. Like they did take their. When you're walking through to get to the uh, Sistine Chapel, you walk through a couple of the um, Vatican library rooms, and there's a lot of art in there, and there's a lot of it about the martyrs. And people did some real jacked up stuff to early Christians. Uh, they like tied to like your legs to two separate things, and then took a saw and cut you apart, bottom up, like so that you're like two two vertical halves. Um, so when they're shown quote in heaven afterwards, they're not like walking around as two halves or limping around as two halves. Um, but they'll be, be holding a saw. Um, you can see here's another, uh, saint and I'm can't quite tell what's happening there, but like, that's going to be the implement of martyrdom. I don't know if they were torn apart on a stretcher or what, but yeah, so you get to be whole again, but you're still holding some like symbol of your martyrdom. Um, right. So there's a lot of chaos and instability during this period. So let's, let's have a little recap of what else is going on politically right now. That's different from the like sunshiny salad days of the high Renaissance. Um, so Protestant reformation. So Martin Luther sort of starts his 99 theses. Everybody knows Martin Luther, started the uh, questioning of the papacy and being like, what the hell's up with? Here's, here's literally 99 problems I have with the uh, papacy. That started in 1517 in Germany, um, but it gained a lot of traction and religious wars started to rage and they raged all through this mannerism period up until 1648. So um, that's a long time to be having, like, religious, Catholic, Protestant, like, serious like, warfare conflict. When did, when did Martin Luther start the 95 Theses? 1517, but that was, like, a little blip in Germany. Like, the news didn't reach Italy in any sort of major impactful way for a couple of years. Um, but, you know, that kind of started that end of the High Renaissance because we're at the end of that – can't say the high renaissance was a peaceful time but it was not like epic religious conflicts so this, the italians were never not fighting amongst themselves so do you think that this painting was like this was like the end of the high renaissance like this painting right here was like um like clarify that it was the end of the high renaissance right now uh, this is like 15 years into the mannerism period so um things were already getting very edgy by this point um, but I think this is a great sort of quintessential, you can see Michelangelo in his high Renaissance self in the ceiling. And then you can see him being like a really angry rebel <laughs> here. Um, so, um, we've got a lot of religious wars happening. Um, Rome got completely like trashed. I mean, it got, a, officially sacked, which means lots of civilians were murdered. There was lots of raping and pillaging and burning and destruction of private property and stuff uh, because uh, Charles V um, and a French army was in league with the papacy. So, um, yeah, the French invaded Italy. Awkward, violent. Um, so stuff was just not pleasant during this time. There was a lot of unrest. Um, anti-classicism so the church began to preach against humanist and classicist ideals so that whole idea of like Greek perfection and weren't the ancient Greeks so great um, that started to really get cracked down on more um, during this period so it couldn't be the thing that artists were aspiring to anymore um, and again moving away from humanism the afterlife once again, became more important than our lifetime. So remember our sort of where we started in the Gothic era, life was shit. So we looked at what our special treat would be when it was over, because this certainly isn't fun 
Um, and then life got a bit better. And so then we started looking at the beauty of our existence on this earth. Um, and now we're moving back into, uh, looking more at the afterlife as sort of our focus in religious art and preaching and philosophy. Um, there's a rejection of the Renaissance classicism. A lot of very important Renaissance pieces are actually painted over very shortly, like a few decades after they were painted because people just didn't want that, that it just wasn't vibing with their tone. Um, we only have like less than two dozen da Vinci's, he did some huge things. He did a massive outdoor mural with like dozens of horses. And it was like a full life size, like a hundred life size people and dozens of horses. And, um, it's gone. It got painted over. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, a lot was lost because the, sh the taste changed very quickly and sort of rejected a lot of these ideas. Um, real quick, um, I remember in one of our previous lessons, they came up with this new way of like using black light or x-rays or whatever to be able to see underneath paintings, to see like the pencil marks or whatever. Could we do that with all these like wall paintings to see which ones were painted over and whatever else? Maybe. Um, that is actually, let me, let me grab another thing that I'm not sharing. Um, do, do. People are working on it. There was actually um, a Baroque artist, and I'm completely forgetting his name. Um, I'm forgetting the story. I'll think of it in the middle of the night. Um, but he was commissioned to um, paint over a high Renaissance piece in this major public <laughs> building in Florence. And so he's like, yeah, 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 okay. Um, and he actually built a false wall and then painted on the new wall that was like an inch and a half above the old one. So he deliberately conserved the Vasari master work that was only like 60 years old so you gotta imagine that this grown-up artist as a kid may have like known Vasari or certainly been inspired by him it was only like one generation ago um so that artist actually saved the painting in like a little false wall air gap and um, it was only rediscovered in the last sort of 20 or 30 years now because, of course, you don't just like bust down buildings with Baroque paintings on them in major government structures. So um, when they started peeking behind there, now they can use sort of um, laparoscopic cameras, the same ones that they used to like put those itty bitty cameras inside your body for surgeries and stuff. They can drill itty bitty little holes and then use a laparoscopic camera to sort of worm it in there and end up getting the rest of the image. Um, if you're wondering about the piece, we've got the Battle of Anghiari. I can type that later if that would make you happy for your own personal references. That's the Lost Leonardo Battle Mural. Um, and I think there might be some work to try to see if it's somewhere in the paint on that wall. Um, but we have all of his sort of prep drawings and stuff because like Michelangelo, like when you do these huge murals, you take huge sheets of paper, like you, you, you draw out the whole thing on like notebook paper and then you take huge, like life-size pieces. You draw out the figures, stab a bunch of holes along the dotted line. And then you can like hold this up to the plaster and just like use a chalk tamp. And then you get like a dotted line of your drawing boom and then you can start painting and not have to worry about um proportions and stuff you've already sorted all of that already on your master drawings so we have da vinci's master drawings of that along the eye but we, the, the painting was painted over the mural was lost i have anyway. a question on this one real quickly um why did they end up editing out all, or editing in all the loincloths do we know why um because uh 
we all become like really buttoned up conservative nutter butters. Yeah, the text the uh, textbook talks about it. Yeah. Um you know, like what's considered good Christianity waffles. So we we vacillate between like the human body is God's greatest creation and like, Oh my God, I can't see that ankle. Certainly can't see those nips and no man junk. So, um, even in great famous sculpture, like little mud, like acanthus leaves get stuck on to the genitals because it was a nude. And then it's like, Oh my God, we can't have that. Let's stick a fig leaf on there. Let's stick a fig leaf on there. Yeah. The reason why I was confused was because you look at like the high Renaissance and it's all, you know, you know, Michelangelo's David, they're naked, they're, you know, everything's in great detail. And then you come to right. this one and you have all the Venus stuff and it's all like completely explicit. But then you go to like these and they're all like, oh, we need to cover this up. And it's like, where is, is that a high Renaissance to mannerism turn or is it not? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, classicism, the ancient Greek stuff was all about the beauty of the new human form. So now if we're getting rid of those sort of pagan classical Greek ideals, then we're going back towards like modesty, censorship. I don't want to see your junk kind of situation. So yeah, it's totally a taste in what's, you know, okay. And what isn't, um, with modesty, I guess. And the fact that that changes within a few decades, I guess we've seen it in our own lifetimes in certain cultures. Um, maybe even our own question mark. I don't know. Um, all right. Yeah. I just Googled the uh, battle of Alandori. That Mm -hmm. is crazy detailed. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked at that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It would have been amazing. Uh, this was? I, it was amazing. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so whenever we're giving a critique, do you want us to give us uh, the background information, like on the time period, like what was going on at the time in history? 